ਦਾ ਪਿਆਰ ਮੈਂ ਦਿਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਲੇ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਦਾ ਲਾਈਵ ਡਿਬੇਟ ਇੰਟੈਲੀਜੈਂਸ ਸਕੁਐਰ ਡਾਟ ਕਾਮ ਆਰ ਫਰਸਟ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਔਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਇਜ਼ ਜਸਟਿਨ ਮਰੋਟਸੀ ਆਈ ਫਰਸਟ ਕੇਮ ਅਕਰੋਸ ਹਿਮ ਜਸਟ ਆਫਟਰ ਹੀ ਕਮ ਬੈਕ ਫਰਮ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ 12 12 12000 kilometer uh, camel journey across the libyan sahara he um remained charmingly sort of unaffected by that and unlike other people we're going to hear about um, managed to keep the friendship of both his camel guides and his travel companion uh, on that trip followed that book up with um a book on tambalin and most recently about herodotus who's going to speak to us now and i never quite tracked down the reality of justin's real day job which is working in Baghdad um helping construct and reconstruct Iraq Thank you very much Barnaby um 12000 would have been good um to have made across the Sahara I think a tenth of that but um more than 12 anyway yeah. um. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be speaking at the RGS again, and it's particularly thrilling to be discussing exploration at its spiritual home in the UK. Contemplating the 10 minutes I have to discuss Herodotus this evening, I feel rather like an Abbasid caliph in medieval Baghdad inspecting the several hundred beautiful concubines of his harem. It's very nice to have them, but it would be good to have a few more. Today we're going back to the ancient world to a man I consider the first great explorer. His name may not be among those around us in this magnificent Ondarchi theatre. Men like Scott, Shackleton, Doughty, women like Gertrude Bell, um, Richard Burton and Everest, but that's entirely excusable since he rather predates the RGS by the small matter of 2320 years. A little bit of introduction. He was born around 490 BC, the year of the Battle of Marathon, and died somewhere between 425 and 420 BC, having lived through this great cataclysm of the Persian Wars, which is the subject of his one-volume masterpiece, The Histories. In other words, he lived through the golden age of Greece, among men such as Socrates and Sophocles, Aeschylus and Aristophanes, Euripides and Pericles. Who was he? Sadly, we know next to nothing about his life. The one thing we do know because he tells us is that he came from this place, Halicarnassus, today the Turkish resort town of Bodrum on the Aegean coast. And there, after three words of the histories, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, the biographical information virtually comes to a halt. We know him as the father of history. Uh if you like Cicero, you might know him as the father of lies, um maybe more of that later. But he was also the first great explorer in a number of senses of the word. First of all, his physical journeys. He traveled through much of Asia Minor, uh Babylon, Egypt, Libya, Lebanon, Palestine, Greece, Italy, and possibly the Black Sea. This map here shows what was then much of the the known world. Um Bogor he of course was in its infancy. But Herodotus goes out, he travels, he explores, and like all good explorers, he returns with discoveries, all sorts of new information, geography, science, history anthropology and high-spirited stories um in herodotus's cases tales of dog-headed men that live in mountains the gold digging ants of india which might have been marmots and the fabulous flying snakes of arabia which were probably locusts second he explores the peoples among whom he travels such as the assyrians here in an age when greeks thought they were god's gift to world civilization which was not an entirely unreasonable assumption He was a multiculturalist before the term existed. He's driven by irrepressible curiosity, the hallmark of a great explorer. He wants to understand what makes people tick. He writes about the Scythians and the Lydians, the Persians and the Egyptians, exploring their religious practices, their political arrangements, languages, and this is a real speciality of Herodotus because like all um good explorers, he's a great storyteller, their sexual practices, quirks and customs. He's also considered the father of anthropology. And finally Herodotus is an explorer in a distinctly literary sense. He's an explorer of the past and the inventor of history. These are the opening lines of the one book he wrote, The Histories. We know what we know about the Persian Wars only because Herodotus has made sure that these great and marvelous deeds as he called them 
have not been forgotten in time, and nor are they without their glory. On a literary level, he's also a consummate stylist, a graceful writer admired by devotees from Gertrude Bell and her friend David Hogarth, former president of the RGS, to Norman Lewis and Rizyard Kapuczynski. Tonight, in the interest of time, we're going to confine Herodotus to Iraq, and more particularly Egypt, which was his greatest passion. Judging by the histories, he seems to have traveled to Babylon, where his quintessentially Greek view that hubris invariably leads to nemesis, uh, Saddam Hussein in Baghdad, still strikes a chord today. <laughs> and Herodotus, the great explorer of people's customs, finds his sexual nirvana in Babylon. I'll give you a moment to read that. Uh, my favorite anecdote about Herodotus in Babylon is his story of how every woman, once in her lifetime, and who is a native of Babylon, has to go and sit in the temple of Aphrodite, and in Herodotus' words, give herself to a strange man. He describes how the rich women, who are far too proud to mix with their lower class sisters, drive to the temple in covered carriages, trailing retinues of servants, sit down and await their unpalatable destiny. All a man has to do for the privilege of having sex with a woman of, a cho of his choice is throw a silver coin into her lap. When that's over, and not before, they are free to leave. And he ends with this lovely line. Tall, handsome women soon manage to get home again, but the ugly ones stay a long time. <laughs> Some of them, indeed, as much as three or four years. <laughs> For Herodotus the Explorer, Egypt is his great swan song in a truly extraordinary achievement, and I think this is his greatest legacy as an explorer, which is what we're discussing today, he amasses the most comprehensive information about Egypt until the 19th century. Flora and fauna, religion, religious practices, mummification, diet, agriculture, geography, the Nile, its source and seasonal flooding, and yes, perhaps inevitably, sex. In fact, he gets totally carried away. Ostensibly, the history is a book about the Persian Wars, or at least it's meant to be, but Egypt ends up taking up a third of the book. Why does he love Egypt? Because there's unfathomable history, whichever way you turn, at least 5,000 years of it. Plutarch, who didn't like Herodotus, called him a philo barbaros, a barbarian lover, which was the ultimate put down in ancient Greece. He was fascinated by the Nile, its mysterious seasonal flooding, its depth, the life-giving silt it generated. And indefatigable explorer that he was, he even tried to discover its source. This point was his furthest south in Egypt, Elephantine, which many of you will know, at the first cataract. And given that Speak only discovered the source of the White Nile in 1858, and that the quest for the true source of the Blue Nile has continued into modern times, this wasn't a bad effort, especially when you consider he was meant to be writing a history of the Persian Wars and was digressing, to put it mildly. What can you say about Herodotus here? He can't help himself. <laughs> Herodotus traveled to Siwa, 350 miles west of Cairo, and writes about the most famous and catastrophic lunch in the annals of desert picnics. In the midst of his campaign against Egypt in about 525 BC, Persian king Cambyses sends a force from Thebes on the Nile to sack the oasis of what we know today as Siwa, then the oracle of Ammon in Libya. And according to Herodotus, when the men had reached a point about midway between the town and the Ammonian border, a southerly wind of extreme violence drove the sand over them in heaps as they were taking their midday meal, so that they disappeared forever. These lines have inspired generations of archeologists to look for the lost army of Cambyses ever since. To this day, it hasn't been discovered though tantalizing signs like daggers, weapon fragments, textiles, and human remains have emerged. And perhaps the most famous man to hunt for these remains of the lost army of Cambyses was Count Laszlo de Almasi, the Hungarian aristocrat, explorer, aviator, and sometimes spy, immortalized by Ralph Fiennes in The English Patient, who I would point out to everyone here, always kept his copy of the histories with him at all times. Just as no trip to Egypt today is complete without visiting the pyramids, so it was for Herodotus two and a half thousand years ago. To put his era in context, when he visited Egypt in the middle of the fifth century BC, the pyramids were as old to him as he is to us. 
There are two reasons Egyptians don't like Herodotus very much, or maybe three. First of all, which is a terrible crime in the eyes of Egyptians, he's not Egyptian. He's a tourist who writes about Egypt, and the Egyptians are very uppity about their history. Second, he wrote that, quote, Egypt is the gift of the Nile, which may sound perfectly harmless to us, but upsets a lot of Egyptians who say, look, the Nile flows through seven countries, but only Egypt has this magnificent civilization. The others are riffraff. We're absolutely marvelous. You can't just credit the river. And the last reason Egyptians aren't keen on our man is because he dares to besmirch the good name of the pyramids with an exceptionally tall story, even by Herodotus' standards. He tells, that the, uh, t he tells us that while building his great pyramid, the pharaoh Khufu ran out of money and was forced to prostituting his daughter to raise more funds. <laughs> Herodotus has the wily woman, no doubt fed up with having to fund daddy's tycoon building project, <laughs> determined to build her own pyramid on the side. And she charges each satisfied customer a two and a half ton block of limestone per trick. <laughs> Egyptians don't like this story very much at all, but I like to think that she um, put her back into it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I commend Herodotus to you as the first great explorer. Like all the greatest writers, he remains relevant long after his death. He even has something to say about our current predicament, as boom has turned so wretchedly to bust. And he writes, often enough, God gives man a glimpse of happiness, then utterly ruins him. Thank you.